hear the manager of a shop talking to a new employee called Penny. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5 on pages 2 and 3. shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Come in. Uh, good morning. It's, uh... Oh, Penny Mon. Oh, yes. Penny, do sit down. Now, I know a lot of things emerged during your interview last week, but uh, I thought it was worth going over the essential stuff again. Yes, absolutely. That'll be very helpful. The first thing is that, given your interest in fashions, we've decided to put you in the dress department. Oh, that's great. Is that next to the children's section? Yes. Now, we've given the section a new name, actually. From next week, it's going to be called the Young Set. Young Star? No, uh, two words. The Young Set. Right. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> now, you'll be required to work a five-and-a-half-day week. Uh, we're closed on Wednesday afternoon and Sunday, of course. Do we get overtime for Saturday? Well, actually, we used to give an extra $2 an hour, but then we decided to make it a flat rate of $6.50 an hour. OK, fine. Um, and the actual hours? Nine to five, with an hour for lunch and 15-minute coffee breaks. And what about holidays? Well, it's three weeks in the first year, and that rises to four weeks in your third year with us. Now, we do give you on-the-job training, which we conduct during normal hours, so you'll be paid for that. Which day? It's on the first Tuesday of every month. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10 on page 3. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, in addition to your basic pay, I should explain that you're entitled to some staff perks, which our assistants do find a valuable benefit. Do we get a discount? That's right. 25% off everything in the store. Although we do make an exception for sale goods, which I'm afraid have no discount. Yeah, fine. Um, and I was wondering about pension arrangements. Mm-hmm. You get a good company pension, which our personnel manager will be able to explain to you in detail. She's in room 12. Worth going along to see her. And who will I be working under? Mr Appleby? The manager of your section is Mrs Waddell. That's W-A-D-D-E-L-L. -L. Mrs Waddell. OK. And apart from serving the customers, will I have any other duties? Good question. Uh, we do ask you to do the window dressing. Oh, I'll enjoy that. And one of the biggest worries in the boutique is shoplifters, so you have to check for them. Will I receive training on that? Yes, yeah, certainly. That'll be one of the sessions next month. Oh, and we'll be asking you to check stock. Right. Yes, of course. And is there a particular dress code in the shop? Right. Well, we're quite flexible. But what we do is ask you to wear a black skirt and the shop will give you a red blouse. We'll also give you a name badge, which you must wear all the time. Yeah, of course. Right. Is there anything else you'd like to ask me? No, that's very comprehensive. Thank you. Good. So we'll see you on Monday. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a recorded message giving tourists travel information in a large city. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 18. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 18. Thank you for calling the tourist line. There are many different ways of getting round the city and we'd like to suggest some you may not have thought of. How about a city trip by boat? There are four main stopping points. From west to east, stop A, Green Banks, Stop B, City Bridge, Stop C, Roman Landing, and Stop D, Newtown. You can find the main booking office at Stop A. The first boat leaves at 8 a.m. and the last one at 6.30 p.m. There are also many attractions you can visit along the river. At Stop A, if you have time, you can visit the fine 16th-century palace here, built for the king, with its beautiful formal gardens. It's very near the booking office. Now you can enjoy every corner of this superb residence. Stop B. Why don't you visit Tower Restaurant, with its wide range of refreshments? This is a place where you can sit and enjoy the wonderful views over the old commercial and banking centre of the city. Stop C is the area where, in the first century AD, invading soldiers crossed the river. This was much shallower than it is now. That's why this area is called Roman Landing. There's an interactive museum to visit here, with a large shop which has a good range of local history books. At the furthest point of the trip, Stop D, the most exciting place to visit is the new editing place to visit is the new entertainment complex with seven screen cinema, bowling alley, and video games arcade. Before you hear the rest of the message, you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20. Now listen and answer questions 19 and 20. Besides the boat tours, there are city buses. Two companies offer special services. The top bus company runs all its tours with a live commentary in English. Tours leave from 8.30 a.m. every 20 minutes. There are departures from Central Station, Castle Hill, and Long Walk. This is a hop-on, hop-off service, and tickets are valid for 24 hours. For further details, call Top Bus on 0208 944 7810. The number one sightseeing tour is available with a commentary in eight languages. Buses depart for part from Central Station every five to six minutes from about 9 a.m., with the last bus at around 7 p.m. There are also number one services with an English-speaking guide. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 3. Part 3. You will hear a lecture on volcanic activity and its effect on the atmosphere. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning, everyone. In these environmental science lectures, I guess you're all used to hearing about global warming. Well, I'm here today to talk to you about one particular volcano and its effect of global cooling. I'll begin by going back a little bit in time. Towards the middle of 1991, the second largest volcanic eruption of the last century occurred in the Philippines, not far from the capital city, Manila, on the island of Luzon. Mount Pinatubo belongs to a chain of volcanoes in the area, and this was by no means its first eruption. There is evidence of eruptions from approximately 500, 3,000 and 5,500 years ago. The events of the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption began in July 1990, when a magnitude 7.8 earthquake occurred 100 kilometers northeast of the Pinatubo region. The sleeping giant was reawakened, but few people had any idea of what was in store for them. In mid-March 1991, many earthquakes were experienced around Mount Pinatubo, and this is when volcano scientists or volcanologists as they are called, started their investigation of the mountain. Before the disaster, thousands of people lived in very close proximity to the mountain, and on April 2nd, small explosions from vents near the crater dusted their villages with ash. This resulted in the order for evacuations of 5,000 people later that month. Earthquakes and explosions continued to harass the residents, and on June 5th, a Level 3 alert was issued for two weeks because of the possibility of a major eruption. However, the appearance of a large amount of lava protruding from the mountain on July 7th led to the announcement of a Level 5 alert on June 9th, indicating an eruption in progress. An evacuation area within 20 kilometers of the volcano was established and this time, 25,000 people were evacuated. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People were evacuated. On the following day, Clark Air Base was evacuated and the danger radius was extended to 30 kilometers from the volcano, resulting in the total evacuation of 58,000 people. On June 15th, just after midday, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo commenced and lasted nine hours causing numerous major earthquakes due to the collapse of the land at the top of the mountain and the creation of a huge caldera. What's a caldera, I hear you say? Well, it's obvious, really. With a huge eruption such as this, where enormous amounts of material have exploded into the air, the summit falls into what is now an empty chamber and thus forms a large crater. As luck would have it, as the eruption was taking place, a tropical storm was passing just to the northeast of Mount Pinatubo, bringing a lot of rainfall to the area. The dust and cinders that had been thrown up into the atmosphere combined with the water vapor from the storm to cause a rainfall of tephra 
that fell across the whole island of Luzon. Most of the people who perished during the eruption did so because of the weight of the ash collapsing roofs and killing the occupants of the houses. If it hadn't been for that passing storm, the death toll would certainly have been much lower. But that's not all. Besides the ash, Mount Pinatubo expelled between fifteen and thirty million tons of sulphur dioxide gas. Can you guess what happened next? Yes, the sulphur dioxide mixed with water and oxygen in the atmosphere to become sulfuric acid, which is a major contributor to ozone reduction. The eruption plume from Mount Pinatubo reached high into the atmosphere, attaining an altitude of thirty-four kilometers, and the resulting aerosol cloud spread around the Earth in two weeks and had covered the planet within a year. During the years 1992 and 1993, the ozone hole situated over Antarctica reached an unprecedented size. The cooling effects of this cloud over the Earth were remarkable. It reduced global temperatures considerably. In the United States, for example, we experienced our third coldest and third wettest summer in 77 years during 1992. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk by a financial advisor about debt. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to today's public lecture on the topic of personal debt. I'm Ray Goodman from the Community Debt Centre, and I'd like to present to you today the second part of our three lecture series. Today we're going to look at how debt affects our lives. Debt is nothing new; it's found throughout human history and in every society. Many people know what it feels like to be in debt. Those of you who have bought a house will probably have a mortgage. Perhaps you have borrowed money from family or friends, or got a loan for a car. Debt can sometimes be a way of juggling financial commitments and of paying in advance for things that you really need. For everyday living, you might not earn enough money from your job to pay for all the things that you need. You may require a little extra money in the form of credit cards. But debt has a darker side. Imagine how you would feel if you were deeply in debt and unable to repay what you owed. The consequences for many people can be disastrous. Today, people in the richer countries of the world live in a society where credit is easily accessible. Banks, building societies, and credit card companies often encourage people to take out loans. They then make money by charging interest. For very low income earners, borrowing from a bank can be impossible. Instead, they are forced to take out a much higher interest loan from a private lender. They soon find that, despite cutting back on many essentials, they are unable to keep up with these repayments. They are forced to take out another loan and find themselves plunging deeper and deeper into debt. People can find themselves with growing debts if they are unable to repay interest. 
This may be because of a sudden life-changing event, such as a business failure or losing a job. But for many households, debt is a means of survival. In developing countries, people borrow a tiny sum of money from a local landowner, for example, to pay for medical treatment. They agree that a child would work as a full-time servant to repay the debt, and that child becomes a bonded labourer. But since they are never paid, there is no hope of clearing the debt. Their life is ruled by fear. With no money, education or experience of life, it is impossible for them to escape. Today, debt bondage is a major form of slavery. As you can see, debt affects everyone all over the world to varying degrees. I hope the information I have presented to you today will make you think twice about getting into spiralling debt. Of course, if you are already finding yourself in financial difficulties, please make an appointment to see one of our helpful staff members after this talk. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.